All right, grab your Bible. Uh, go to Exodus chapter 3. You already know what I'm going to say, but there are Bibles on the back table in multiple languages. So take one, take five. I don't care. Uh, there's two different translations. So take, take them and use one or give it out or do whatever you want with it, uh, but, but you need a Bible. And the reason you need a Bible is though the, a lot of the lyric, lyrics, a lot, of, a lot of the text will be on the screens, um, I, you can't take the screen with you. We talk about this every week. You can't take the screen with you. And it's important that you're able to take his word with you, not my word. I want you to take notes. There's sheets back there for that too. So you can take notes. The notes are not for me. The notes are not for you. The notes are for who you're going to tell later. So when you go to explain something and somebody says, well, where'd you get that from? You can look back at your note and go, oh, that's Exodus chapter 3, verse 5, whatever. So you need, you need those things. They're all back there. Anyway, we're in Exodus chapter 3. We are in the second book now. Uh, we will be moving through the Bible much quicker than we did thus far. Genesis covers a lot of history um, in one book. So now as we progress through, we won't be in Exodus as long and we'll move through these quicker. But we are following the story of God all the way through from the beginning of the book to the end. It's the story of God. It's not the story of David. It's not the story of Daniel. It's not the story of Abraham. It's not the story of Josh. It's not the story of Deidre. It's not the story of Coach. It's not the story. It's the story of God. So we're looking at him as we go through. And thus far, we've looked at who he is before creation, kind of the Trinity, which is going to be interesting. We're going to come back to that today. But we've looked at who he was. We've looked at how he created all things. We looked at how uh, sin entered the world, and Adam and Eve fell, and mankind fell because of that. We moved through the flood. We moved through uh, Abraham and his family and Isaac and Jacob. And we're following this promise that God made to Eve all the way back in the very beginning that he would send a deliverer, a seed, a child that would right the wrong. So we're, we're kind of following that. And we moved to Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. Those 12 sons became tribes of Israel, nation of Israel, right? And so then from that, we zoomed in on Joseph. That was last week, and we looked at him for a minute. Um, the promise of God is going to continue. The seed is going to continue through Judah, but we zoomed in on Joseph for a minute. And uh, now today, we're jumping way into the future, 400 years, in fact, into the future. And today we're going to look at something probably most important uh, in the Bible, and that is, who is God? Like, who is he? Greatest question you could possibly ask, a most important question you'll ever face. I don't care who you are. If you're a human being, it is the single most important question you'll ever face. Who is God? And today I'm going to show you. Not because of me, but because his word does. So go to Exodus chapter 3. Let me read a couple of verses here. Uh, I'm going to read starting in verse 2. And it says, uh, The angel of the Lord appeared to him, Moses, in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I'll turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, don't come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Let me pray. Lord, you are amazing. Your word is amazing. Um, and this particular text is amazing. I've been wrestling with the weight of it. I've taught it before. I've read it countless times. But I feel like it's among the most heavy and important texts in the Bible. And so as I attempt to unpack your word here, Lord, I, I mean it more than ever that I don't put any words in your mouth. That you put your words in my mouth. You put your words in our hearts. Let us understand what your word says through your Holy Spirit and not what David has to say about it. Lord, I love you and I ask these things for your glory in Christ's name. Amen. So, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the term catfishing. Probably the younger generation might be. To me, catfishing will always equal Uncle Larry's restaurant in downtown Chattanooga, Tennessee, who has the best catfish you will ever eat in your entire life. 
Uh, but that's obviously not uh, what it means in modern age, modern times. You with me? You know. <laughs> Modern day social media age, catfishing is, uh, refers to when you pretend to be someone you are not. You steal somebody else's identity and you kind of, or you don't necessarily steal their identity, but you put off a persona that you are somebody that you are not online. So, for instance, you may think you're talking to someone online. Uh, you might be a woman and you think you're talking to the man of your dreams and it turns out it's a you know, 14-year-old girl messing around or, or something like that, goofing off. Um, in fact, it got so big that in 2012, MTV ran a series about catfishing where they exposed people for who they were, and it ran for like eight seasons. Uh, and then now there's more recently, what is it, started around 2020 or so, there's a reality show, what's that thing called? The Circle or something like that, where it's based on the same thing, but they pretend to be people that they're actually not and see who they can convince to believe uh, through social media or online presence, whatever. Uh, TV, social media, chat rooms, all those kind of things, they can be dangerous, no doubt. They can be exciting and all, all that kind of stuff. And the fact is, they could really be dangerous, but what about spiritual matters? What about spiritual matters? Do we ever treat spiritual matters that way? Think about how many people treat their belief in God the same way. Just saying it. They talk to God, a God. You, you, you're, you say you worship a God, you talk to a God, you have your thoughts about who God is, you believe you are talking to this particular individual in your head, but in reality, have no idea who you're really talking to. No, no real idea who you're talking to. And the sad thing is that, unfortunately, many Christians do the same thing too. So we're Christians, we claim that we belong to Christ, but we might do the same thing too, right? We, we're talking to him, we go to him in prayer, but we really don't have any idea who we're talking to. Or maybe we have in our brain some image of what we think God is or who we're talking to, but we don't actually take the time to find out is that really who he is? Or is that really the way he is? Do we take the time to get in there? So that's what we're looking at today because we have no excuse. No one has an excuse because he has introduced himself. So it's not the, the idea that we can't know who God is is not true. He has firmly introduced himself. So on the sheet, I always put the one sentence kind of thought, and I'll just tell you what it is. If you grabbed the sheet, fine. If you didn't, it's okay. But is this, it's kind of a, a one thought to hold on to. In the same way that God reveals his identity here to Moses for the sake of a mission to salvation, Jesus reveals his true identity to us so that we'll carry the gospel of salvation to others. There's a purpose in knowing who God is, okay? Background. So we ended with Joseph, right? All right, Joseph was where? In Egypt, correct, in Egypt. And he moved all of these tribes, his whole family, to Egypt. And Genesis ends with Joseph dying in Egypt. Uh, and then Exodus begins. And when you turn that one page in your Bible, you're turning about 400 years. So there's a new uh, Pharaoh, obviously, because the Pharaoh who knew Joseph dies. So there's a new Pharaoh. The new Pharaoh has no loyalty to Joseph, no loyalty to the people of Israel. And in fact, over the next 400 years, he begins to, they enslave, all, it says all the Egyptians, enslave them, the Hebrew people, and force them to build their cities, even name some of those cities. Uh, and it, it uses the term ruthlessly, enslaving them. So they, they were but hateful towards them. They weren't just making them work. They were hateful towards them. Exodus 1 verse 12 says, but the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and the more they spread abroad. That's a little side note, but it's a cool one. That's why I pointed it out. In God's economy, listen, in God's economy, persecution always promotes growth. In God's economy, persecution always promotes growth. So these people are being persecuted, but they just keep growing. And the Pharaoh takes drastic steps and orders all of the newborn Hebrew boys to be killed. Throw them in the Nile. Because he wants the growth of the population to stop. Uh, horrible thing. You can read all of this stuff. It's in there. I'm just moving forward. Moses is born at this exact time. Moses is born into a family of the tribe of Levi. So of the 12 kids, Levi is the one to whose father 
descendancy he comes from, Moses does. So he's born in the tribe of Levi. Moses is born a baby at this time, but his family saves him because they build a basket, almost like an ark, and they put him in it as a little baby. They set it on the Nile, which sounds crazy because I imagine that being the most dangerous place in the whole wide world to put a newborn baby uh, between alligators and whatever else. But they put him in this basket. They put him on the Nile. They float him float him down and surely crying and praying and whatever else. And the daughter of the Pharaoh herself finds him floating, recognizes that he's a Hebrew child, but still chooses to raise him. There's more details here. You can read it because you have the Bible. I didn't write it, so you can go read it. But she brings him into her home. She raises him. And Moses grows up in her home. And Moses is kind of trapped now between two different worlds because Moses knows he's a Hebrew. And I can imagine that the Hebrew people hate Moses because they're miserably suffering in slavery. And here's one of them who is in the palace, you know, a, a child technically of the Pharaoh. And then I'm sure that the the uh, Egyptians can't stand him either because he's a dirty, filthy slave. What business does he have being in the palace of the Pharaoh? So I, I don't know, but I feel like he's trapped. Well, he's about 40 years old, and he attempts to stop an Egyptian from beating a Hebrew. He can't take it anymore. So he attempts to stop this moment, and in the process of doing it, he kills the Egyptian uh, and then tries to hide the body. And as a response to that, it, it gets exposed. Pharaoh puts a hit on Moses, says, you're a dead man. Moses runs for his life out into the desert and goes to, ends up in a land called Midian, which is kind of, if you know where Saudi Arabia is on a map, it's kind of north, northern Saudi Arabia. So from Egypt, he gets all the way to kind of northern Saudi Arabia. And Moses ends up meeting a woman there uh, at a well and then falls for this woman, goes to work for her father, Jethro, uh, her name is Zipporah, and so he settles down with her, he has a child with her, and life is great. He becomes a shepherd, taking care of sheep, I assume, or goats or whatever, for uh, his father-in-law, and life is grand for 40 more years. Now, I'm making this point because I want you to know, Moses is 80 when what we're looking at today happens, 80, a real-time 80. People didn't live to be 800 years in Moses' time. So 80 is 80. All right? 80 years old when this happens. All right, so after 40 years and all of that, look uh, in Exodus chapter 2 in verse 24. It tells you what's going on in heaven. It says, God heard the groaning of the people of Israel, the Hebrews, and God remembered his promise or his covenant to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob that he'd give them this land. And God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. That word knew means intimate. So he's like intimately aware with their hurt. I point that out because that's a great verse to remember. I try to keep that one in my head periodically. God heard and God knew. Sometimes you may not feel like God hears you. I can tell you right now, God hears you and he knows. He's intimately connected with your hurt. If you don't believe that, imagine what it would look like to see your own son nailed to a cross. Trust me, he knows, okay? So, verse 1, chapter 3, Exodus, it says, Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he, he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness, and they came to Horeb. Horeb is Sinai. It's the same word. It's interchangeable. It's the same place. And it says the mountain of God. It became known as the mountain of God after this. So, at the moment, it's not saying that it was God's mountain to Moses. It's just saying that's the place he ends up, Okay. So from the start, I will say this, God's choice of a champion is pretty questionable. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Yeah, you're with me. I know. It's pretty questionable. He's a murderer. He's a fugitive. This is for real, guys. Real, just like it would be today. He's a murderer. He's a fugitive. And he's a shepherd, which is the lowest form of job you could have for the most part. I mean, this is a questionable choice for God. He likely knew very little about the God of Israel. And he probably knew a great deal about the gods of Egypt, more than likely. Um, so this is as much an introduction, what we're going to read and look at here, as a responsibility to act. Not only is this a moment of, hey, I got a job for you, but hey, this is who I am. And in the same way, when we meet Christ, when you meet Christ, that introduction comes with the responsibility the same way, 
You don't just run into Jesus and then now I'm a Christian and that's it. That is not the way it happens. When you see him and you recognize him and you know him and you surrender to him, you have an immediate responsibility. Uh, one, be baptized, be associated with him. And then two, go set the captives free, preach the gospel. Go preach the gospel. Again, like Joseph, there's a model of Christ that develops in Moses' life. We looked at that last week. Same thing here with Moses. Just a couple. Moses' uh, experience is kind of a, a miraculous birth. He should have been killed at his birth. In fact, uh, Jesus, you can go look at Jesus. When Jesus is born, same thing happens. Herod orders all of the newborn children killed. Uh, Jesus is a shepherd, calls himself the good shepherd. Moses is a shepherd at this moment. Both are sent to set captives free. We could go on and on, but let's keep going. Verse 2. And we're going to unpack this, but I'm going to read it to you again really quick. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him, Moses, in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it's not consumed. Now, I'm reading this, but get the picture. Put it in your head. Imagine what you're looking at. And Moses said, I'll turn aside to see this, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush. Moses, Moses, he said, I'm here. Then he said, don't come near. Take our sandals off your feet. The place on where you're standing is holy ground. Excuse me. And he said, I'm the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Okay, keep this in front of you because we're going to pull it apart a minute. So consider the moment. God is introducing himself. Literally what he's doing. Just like you come in the door and I say, hey, I'm Dave. I mean, from Atlanta, Georgia, you know, however you look at it, but I live here. We've been here for four years. I mean, he's introducing himself outright to him. He begins with this uh, angel of the Lord character here. This is a specific person. It doesn't say an angel of the Lord. It says the angel of the Lord. We mentioned this before, but I'm coming back to it because this is a key moment. It's God's visible presence on the earth. I will argue that pretty heavily. Not everybody would agree, but I will argue that pretty heavily. When it says the angel of the Lord, it's God's visible presence on the earth. You'll see this again with Samson. You'll see it again with Gideon. We'll talk about it. You'll see him again. Um, we've already seen him once before. Think about it. How do you describe seeing God if you saw him? What, what terms would you use? You know, In other places we've already looked at, Abraham and Jacob both saw him, but they called him a man, Right? Called him, called him a man, but they also said they knew that this was God that they were seeing. So I don't know. You see this person. By the time we get to Solomon, King Solomon, you'll have language of God's son starting to pop up. By the time you get to the New Testament, what do we got? Jesus, right? God's son who is all man, all God on earth, visible and seen and known. Um, and notice, look back at the text there, what Moses says it says, when Moses turns to look, it says, the Lord speaks to him from the bush. The angel's the one in the bush. And the person standing in the bush says, I am God of your fathers. So the person he's looking at is identifying himself as God. Why stand on a bush? You ever ask? See, these are the questions I ask. Because I picture this junk. Why stand on a bush? If I was going to meet Javier out, you know, in, on Gila River out there somewhere, I'm not going to stand in the middle of a bush. Stand beside a bush. Might get under a bush if it's, you know, if the sun's clear. I'm not going to stand in a bush. It's really a, a strange thing. But the point here, it's not that the bush is special. And it's unfortunate that the title of that is the burning bush. Because the bush is really not that big a deal. The point of standing in the bush is that the fire is special. That the angel is special. The angel's not consumed either. Angel's not burning. Uh, he's standing on the bush. Both the angel and the fire are super, supernatural. The bush is just a bush. The bush is just a bush. The, it's not burning, but that's because the fire is supernatural, because the angel is supernatural. But it is this supernatural event of a bush that is on fire yet not burning up that gets Moses' attention. It draws him over to see. Moses is close enough that he could see it and know it's not burning up, but he obviously doesn't see the angel yet that's standing there. That would be the story of Jesus' life. 
doing miracles and miracles and drawing in all these crowds with these big miracles, and they totally miss the angel standing there on fire, the presence of God in the moment, because all they're looking at is miracles. We do the same thing if we're not careful. We start looking for miracles. We want to see a burning bush. I want to see a burning bush that doesn't burn up, but we don't. We look right past the fact that what, what's really going on here is God himself introducing himself. Uh, that's what we need to be looking for. But there's more. Look at this wording. Look at back at verse 4. Verse 4 is one of the wildest verses in the Bible, even in English. So I don't even have to flip it to Hebrew. You just read it straight like it says in English, and it's strange. When the Lord saw that Moses turned aside to see. It doesn't say when the Lord saw that Moses came over to him. It says when the Lord saw that Moses went over to look at, the bush, then he spoke to him from the bush, but the angel of the Lord is already in the bush. You got this image of God also being outside watching, observing Moses going over to see. This is a picture of the Trinity. You have an, a, a, a father God who is watching the moment. You have an, an angel, the angel of the Lord, the son, you could say, standing in the bush, and you have the presence of fire could represent the Holy Spirit easily because the Holy Spirit is tied to fire in multiple places. Deuteronomy 4, Acts chapter 2, Matthew chapter 3. So you have this almost presence of God. And listen, this is the most key thing you'll hear me say out of all of this. He's not explaining how he is. He's explaining who he is. Listen to what I'm saying. He's not explaining how he is. He's explaining who he is. And too many religions, and I could name some that you would know very well, prominent ones here in, even in the valley, attempt to explain how he is. We don't have to explain how he is. Until you can create a universe, you don't got to worry about that. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, Paul wrote this. For by him, by Jesus... All things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. If I stop right there, that's already enough. There can be no other God. If there was, he created them. So he created everything, visible and invisible. Rulers, thrones, dominions, powers, everything. And he created them for himself. So he's telling you right there, Jesus is the ultimate God. But he goes on and he says, for he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So there's nothing that was before Jesus, God or otherwise. Nothing that was before Jesus. He holds all things together. He is the head of the body of the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, that in everything he might be first, preeminent. Verse 19, for in him all the fullness of God would please to dwell. Could park it on that. And through him, to reconcile, through Jesus, to reconcile to himself, Jesus, all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Listen, I love that Paul makes no attempt to explain that. I can sit here and make an attempt to explain it, but you're going to have an argument. Paul didn't even try. i give you another one you all know. John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and was God. Was God. How's that possible? John doesn't even attempt to explain. He goes on. He says, He, the Word, or Christ, was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Everything created, period, was made through and for Christ. Again, John makes no attempt to explain how he can be with and also God. In fact, John twists it even farther in the same chapter in verse 18. He says, no one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side has made him known. That makes zero sense. I'm just going to tell you, it doesn't make any sense. No one's there. The only God who is at the Father's side. But John makes no attempt to explain how that's possible. John's just telling you, I met him, and this is the story. I met him, and, and, and this is the story. So when the angel then says, take off your sandals, what makes the ground holy? Yeah. 
It's not the dirt. It's, it's the fact that God is there. That God, this, not an angel, way bigger than an angel. This is the, what we say, Trinity. This is the complete presence of God in that moment. Why take your shoes off? Well, you know what? Be careful. We, there's customs. We don't got to go in here. Why don't we take our shoes off when we come in? Uh, it's a custom of the day. The point was honor this moment as significant change something honor this moment as significant and do it in light of the person who's making the moment significant you know what i mean so so what how do we do that today well you know what sad is i started trying to think about this what are some customs we do today for when we're in the presence of holiness and there's just not many you know why we just don't treat holiness that way anymore and i say this with my own shame we just don't do it, not in our private lives, not in our homes, not at church. We treat holy moments like they're common everyday moments. And then we get frustrated why God doesn't ever reveal himself in a holy moment. You know what, you know what I'm saying when I say that? Like we're driven by casual, comfortable. Like we're driven by entertainment and demand for personal satisfaction like I want this to entertain me I want this to be good for me I want this to make me happy I want to be comfortable sitting here and the thought of holiness only gets linked to prayer and good behavior you know I'm going to be holy I'm going to be good it's not linked to humility in a specific moment where we expect the presence of God to be there I love what Deidre said earlier in that prayer, like if I've been thinking about that myself, if, if Christ was standing right in front of you, how would that change the way you were suddenly speaking or acting or behaving? Uh, I was talking about this this week, but I heard a Kenyan pastor recently say in a video, he said, the human soul is too heavy an object to be lifted into the presence of God by the twigs of entertainment. So the human soul is too heavy an object to be lifted into the presence of God by the twigs of entertainment. And what he's saying is if that's all it's about is a show, if it's just about making you happy, you really don't need to expect to see God. You really don't. Not only, look, not only is it about being obedient, but it's about just humility. Like just a sense of like humility before the holiness of God you know, that's going to determine what you're expecting. I can guarantee you that. It won't be because you choose to come for the show. If you come for the show, you're going to be mad because the music skipped. Or you're going to be mad because it's too loud. Or you're going to be mad because it's too soft. Or you're going to be mad because I'm boring you. Or whatever it's going to be. That If you're coming for the show, you're going to be disappointed. But if you're coming because you're expecting to see him, that's going to change the way you approach the moment. You know what I'm saying? Not only does Moses remove his shirt, I mean shoes, but he hides his face. Like that literally means he throws himself on the ground. You know, he turns around and kneels, you know, puts his face down. Again, evidence, by the way, that he's recognizing that this angel is God. But God goes on to introduce himself even more fully. Look at verse 12, uh, 13. It says, then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and I say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What do I say? Fair question. Moses is getting brave, by the way, in this conversation. Uh, Verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And God said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. That's what he already said. He already introduced himself that way. That word Lord, all caps, L-O-R-D, is the word I am. All right, we'll look at that in a second. Then he goes, this is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. He says, I am presently the God of your fathers. Abraham, presently, I still am there, God. They are still in my presence, is what he's saying. In fact, Jesus unpacked this to make the point that God is eternal and that even those who have died in faith are still calling him and worshiping him as God. In Matthew 22, verse 31, Jesus said, As for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So he's the God of 
not, he is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. So what he's make, point Jesus is making is by saying, I am God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When he says that to Moses, what he's saying is, though they died hundreds of years ago, I am still their God presently right now. Uh, he says his name is I am. So that word I am is cramming three Hebrew, three verbs together, is, was, be. So he, he is God, or excuse me, he was God, he is God, and he'll be God. Thus, he is always God. I am. Every moment is the present moment to him at the same time. I know it hurts your head. It should. He created the universe. It's okay. All right? He, he, he is all three, is, was, and be. I'll show you his, here's the way it looks in Hebrew, and I'm showing you this because it's important. That first character, it reads from right to left. So the first character has a, a Y or a J sound. The second one has an H sound. The next one has a V sound, sometimes W sound. And the last one has an H sound. So how, we're missing something, though. We don't have vowels in order to know exactly how this word is supposed to sound. The reason why is because the Jews stopped saying it. They thought it was too holy a word, so they stopped speaking it. So because of that, we only have the, the consonants. So if you combine those consonants and you stick in vowels, you're going to come up with Jehovah or Yahweh. You can, just depending on whether you go with a J sound or a Y sound, whether you go with a V sound or a W sound, if you put an A here or an E there. So nobody's positive. Does it, is it Jehovah or is it Yahweh? Nobody's certain. It's okay, though. It's okay. But what's wild to me is they stopped saying it because they thought it was too holy. And... God gave his name for Moses to go tell them. Go tell them my name. Say to them, this is my name. And now they've said, oh, it's too holy, so they stopped saying it. Now I'm okay with that because I honestly think that was an, actually a divine action on God's part because as of Acts chapter 4, Peter said, there is no other name under heaven by which men may be saved except who? The one name, Jesus, exactly, Jesus. In fact, Jesus points himself out as this person. At John chapter 8, verse 58, John, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, before even Abraham was, I am. Says that exact title. So people always say, well, Jesus never called himself God. Jesus couldn't have called himself God more blatantly than saying that. And it goes on to say that they picked up stones to throw at him. So what does that tell you? They understood crystal clear what he was saying. They understood crystal clear. And if you want stronger language that this person is Jesus, you can look at his own brother, half-brother, Jude. Jude and Jude only got one chapter. So in verse 5 of Jude chapter 1, it says, Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who didn't believe. I'm not trying to unpack all that. I just want you to see that Jude said it was Jesus that saved the people from Egypt. It was Jesus that saved the people from Egypt. So how then do we explain God? Wrap this up. How do we explain God? Well, we can't. And honestly, we got to stop trying. But that doesn't mean we can't know him. That has nothing to do with having to say, well, uh, because I can't explain him, I, I don't know him. There is no one like our God. One of the most powerful verses in the Bible is in Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 6. It says, the Lord, thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no other God. Now, hold on. He just got through saying the Lord of hosts and his Redeemer. He just named two people. He said, me and him, Dave, Dave translation here, me and him, I'm the only God. That doesn't even make sense, right? But that's what he's saying. I am the only God. I'm the first, the last. There's nobody besides me. And then verse 7, he goes on, because he knows it's confusing, and he says, well, who's like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare it and set it before me. What he's saying is, compare me to somebody. 
Be like saying, define God and give me three examples. Forget it, man. You can't. You can't compare him to anything. And that's what he's trying to say. I, 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 you can't compare me to anybody. But he's made himself known. He's introduced himself in Exodus chapter 3, verse 7. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard the cry of their taskmasters. I know their suffering, and I have come down to deliver them. I have come down to deliver them. It doesn't mean he was in some outer space place and he descended through the clouds to the earth. It means he has dropped from whole, his ultimate level and plane of existence to where we are. He has humbled himself in a sense. He has stepped down in a sense to where we are to deliver us. I love those words. Look at them again. I have seen. I have heard. I know. And I've come down to deliver. That's a good word. That, that's a good word. So when we say we know him, that doesn't mean we have to define him. All right. He spoke the universe into existence. What kind of idiot would attempt to say they can explain that person? And I'm not trying to be a jerk, but you, you, you're crazy. He spoke the worlds into existence. Why in the world would you think you could explain that? But we know him, not because we can explain him, but because he's made himself known. Because he's made himself known. So, what is the identity of God based on his own introduction? What can we say about him? Well, we can say this. He is fire. He is angel. He is unique, without a doubt. He's supreme over nature. He is holy, outright. He speaks. He hears. He sees. He is seen. He appears. He is Trinity, and by that I mean he's beyond our understanding. He's forever present at every moment in time. He is I am. He is, communicates, talks in response. It's not just like you're throwing prayers at the heavens and he weighs them out. He responds. He intimately cares. He rescues. He uses his creation for his plans didn't have to do that. He could just boast it from the heavens, but instead he chooses to use you and me. He is God of fire, not the devil. He is the God of fire. He is spirit and he is Jesus. I can say all of that about him from that little piece of text right there, and we could probably go on all day long from that little piece of text. Can I explain how? No, but I can say I know him and I know all of those things. So what do we do with this? Well, how much time do you spend in his words seeking to know him? How much time? Don't answer me out loud, but think about it a minute. How much time? Do you, no, I'm not talking about your daily reading. I'm talking about I want to know you Digging, seeking, like memorizing, sharing. I got to talk about this. I got to know. I got to know him. And then second is, again, it's on your sheet. Moses sees and knows God reveals himself to Moses because he has a plan for Moses to go bring salvation to his people. God given you the same challenge if you know Christ. If you've given your life to Christ, you have the same exact challenge. If you truly know him, if you know his identity, then there should be a natural burden on your heart to go lead people out of bondage, to share the gospel with them and lead them to Christ. And look, maybe you're, uh, maybe that's not your experience. Maybe you're, maybe you're angry with God. Maybe God hasn't done things in ways in your life that you feel like's fair. Maybe you feel like your life is uh, ignored by God. Maybe He's disappointed you. Maybe He's um, not who you think he is. And I got to say, we got to start there. Have you truly been acquainted? Because if you don't know the gospel, if you can't say without a doubt that Jesus Christ is your only hope, 
that Jesus Christ is your Savior, if you can't recognize that the cross is the only answer, then I can tell you right now, you might be praying to somebody, but it's not God. Because it all starts there. Stand up with me and I'm going to pray and we're going to sing another song and then we'll get out of here. Um, And let me ask you to just bow your head, close your eyes for a minute. I'm not being dramatic. This is just so that you have a moment to focus on what we've been talking about and what we've been saying. And again, I'm not being dramatic. I just want you to just shut the world up a minute and just think about what, what we've been sitting here saying. What do you need to change? What needs to happen in your life to make holiness set apart? Um, And if you're here today and you don't know the gospel, let's start right there. Can you admit who you are? Nobody's got to tell me. I know I'm a sinner. Can Can you admit that? Can you confess that and admit that you know that's a fact? Can you trust in what he did? Can you believe it? Can you say, I can't explain it. I can't say how, but for whatever reason, I believe that he came out of that grave. I believe that he died on a cross. I believe that he only did that because the sin in me is too great. And I'll never make it to heaven, but he paid for that. Can you trust that? Can you trust that he's alive, that he came out of a grave? Can you trust that his action alone is enough? Can you put your faith in him and say, if I stand before God today, I know that what he did is enough. What I did will never be, but what he did is enough. If you can, tell him. You don't have to tell me. Tell him however you want. Lord, you are amazing. And that's, that is a almost cliche word at this point. Thank you for being a loving God. Thank you for being a suffering God. Thank you for being intimately connected with us. God, thank you for giving us your word that we can know you better. Let us stop taking for granted that it's a book with writing in it. Lord, thank you for the privilege of sharing that word with other people. I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about all of us. That you put it in our hands and you, you want us to represent you. I just re- What I just read, what Moses saw, what Moses, you want us to represent that. Lord, I, I think about the weight of Moses who would go do that. And we'll talk about that next week. But would, would have to go represent you in the same way before world ruler. Lord, help us be faithful to your word. And I pray today, God, that you're glorified by... Um, our words as we begin to sing. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.